Welcome, and thank you for joining us at the 12th Annual Discerning Diverse Voices Symposium, hosted by the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. The Diversity Symposium is one of our college's signature events that has helped to position CNIS as a leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion at the University of Alabama and among our peers. Our theme this year, It's Not Over Yet, reflects the urgency we have felt to address social justice issues that have made the media headlines over the past several months. But these are not new issues for America, and neither is this diversity symposium. We have created opportunities for sharing research and sparking dialogue about diversity and inclusion for more than a decade. And we have kept the event free for all scholars, students, professionals, and community members to eliminate a potential barrier to inclusion in our symposium. We are fortunate that the virtual platform we are using this year has allowed us to include even more voices than before. And I look forward to engaging in renewed conversations with you. All of us in CNIS recognize the important role discerning diverse voices plays in providing a platform for students, faculty, and staff to showcase the knowledge being created in this all important area of study. Several books, book chapters, and journal articles now in print were originally presented at this symposium. Clearly, we have created a very effective vehicle for showcasing and advancing the good work of scholars in our college and across our nation. As you know, this is the first year we have used a virtual format, and there are several people who helped make the event possible during this rather unconventional year. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Diane Bragg and Dr. Kristen Warner for providing leadership to the organizing committee for this year's event. We thank them and the committee members for their hard work and dedication to this effort. Thanks to their work, we received paper and panel presentations from coast to coast. I also want to thank the members of the college's diversity forum and our student ambassadors who are helping the sessions to run smoothly today. And a big shout out to Dr. Suzanne Horsley, our assistant dean and symposium director. She has worked tirelessly to make this event a virtual success. The virtual presentation was made possible by the addition of two diversity symposium sponsors. First, Big Communications, led by CEO and founder John Montgomery, is the symposium's gold level sponsor and presenter of the keynote session that you are about to experience. We are grateful for their support that has helped us to keep the diversity symposium free and accessible to all who wish to participate. Second, the Planck Center for Leadership and Public Relations, led by Dr. Carla Gower, is the symposium's silver level sponsor and the presenter of the 1 p.m. panel featuring leaders in the communication industry. I hope you will take a few minutes today to meet with and thank our sponsors during their sessions and in our symposium's networking room. Thank you for being a part of the activities today and best wishes for an excellent symposium. Next up, Dr. Suzanne Horsley, Assistant Dean and Symposium Director, will introduce our keynote speaker. Good morning and welcome to the 12th Annual Discerning Diverse Voices Symposium. I am Suzanne Horsley, Assistant Dean for Diversity at the University of Alabama's College of Communication and Information Sciences. As Dean Nelson said, this is our first year using a virtual format for our symposium, so thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to extend another thank you to our gold level sponsor of today's keynote presentation, Big Communications, based in Birmingham, Alabama. I hope you'll have the opportunity to engage with representatives from Big throughout today's symposium. I'm delighted that we have presenters and attendees from coast to coast. The topics we are sharing today cover many perspectives on diversity and inclusion, and today's keynote presentation reminds us that these ideas are certainly not new ones. Our speaker, Dr. Kimberly Mangan, is an associate professor of communication at the University of Utah. For over a decade, she traveled to Alabama to dig through dusty archives as she pieced together the story of Emory O. Jackson, editor of the Black-owned Birmingham World from 1940 to 1975. As the saying goes, journalists watch history unfold, and Jackson not only had a front seat to watch the history of civil rights in America, but he was recording it, advocating it, and preserving it for future generations. Dr. Mangan has helped us understand Emrio Jackson as a person and as a historic figure. She also reminds us that the work he did during the 1900s is still unfinished today. 
The biography was awarded an honorable mention for the 2020 Book of the Year Award by the American Journalism Historians Association. Before she finished her book on Emory O. Jackson in 2019, Dr. Mangan published the definitive biography of one of Oregon's most dynamic civil rights activists, journalist Beatrice Morrow Kennedy. As a result of her research, a Portland area school district named a new elementary school after Kennedy. A documentary inspired by her book was nominated for a regional Emmy and airs on Oregon Public Broadcasting. Dr. Mangan earned her PhD at the University of Oregon and joined the University of Utah in 2006. She teaches courses on journalism and mass communication history and conducts research on the black press and civil rights. Yesterday, Dr. Mangan shared some of her teaching expertise in her workshop about her capstone course, Voices of Utah, a community engaged learning experience that teaches aspiring journalists how to report on historically excluded groups and neighborhoods. Now I present my good friend, Dr. Kimberly Mangan, whom I thank for her time and energy as she shares her research with us today. Good morning. It is an honor to join you today for this 12th annual symposium. I would like to thank Dr. Nelson and the College of Communication and Information Sciences for hosting this important event. I also thank Dr. Horsley, director of the symposium, not only for the warm introduction, but also for her months of meticulous planning to ensure a seamless virtual event. We meet today to celebrate diversity, share ideas, discuss our research, and promote inclusion and equity but we also are meeting during a pandemic that has underscored dire discrepancies in healthcare. And we gather to grapple with the reality that the fight for civil rights waged by Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, Emory Jackson, and thousands more since 1619 is not yet done. Jackson's fight for equal rights spanned 35 years. That is remarkable in itself, but particularly so when we reflect on the fact that his career included World War II, the decisions in Brown v. Board of Education, the violent desegregation of the University of Alabama, the 1963 Birmingham campaign and 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, the 1965 March for Voting Rights from Selma to Montgomery, and the assassinations of black and white leaders. Jackson became acquainted with Dr. King early in 1955 when the young man was invited to address the Birmingham branch of the NAACP. King had only just celebrated his 26th birthday, and he was still in his first year of his, of his pastorate at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. Jackson worried about turnout at the meeting and urged readers to attend. The guest will give a good message, he wrote in the Birmingham world. You should hear it. Eleven months later, Jackson had a front row seat to history when he scribbled notes for his story about the first mass meeting of the Montgomery Improvement Association and the impending bus boycott. The journalist described King's ringing oratory and quoted the minister as saying, our weapon is the weapon of protest. Jackson's initial coverage of that historic meeting on December 5, 1955, may have been a journalistic scoop for him and the Birmingham world. During the next 13 months of the protest, the paper published more than 150 items about King, the boycott, and bombings related to the protest for equality. That content included Jackson's editorials and columns and local and wire service stories. Jackson wrote extensively about violence in Birmingham and attacks on Black-owned homes, businesses, and churches. In editorials and his columns, he observed that the acts of terrorism typically occurred in patterns. For example, court rulings outlawing neighborhood segregation were followed by bombings that signaled outright defiance of law and order. Jackson decried the violence, and he repeatedly called on elected officials and the Department of Justice to solve the crimes and protect people from the wanton hostility. I hope these brief glimpses into Jackson's career illustrate why I spent a decade learning about him and his newspaper. My research has revealed a man who was born for battle, a roll up your sleeves kind of journalist who worked tirelessly for civil rights using the twice weekly Birmingham World, 
countless public speaking engagements, and the NAACP. In our remaining time today, I will highlight three significant aspects of Jackson's career. First, his efforts to help Othreen Lucy and Polly Myers matriculate at the University of Alabama. Last month marked the 65th anniversary of Lucy's courageous role in desegregating the university. This year, we also observe the 60th anniversary of the Freedom Rides. I will briefly discuss Jackson's response to the attacks on the bus passengers and the newsmen who covered the interstate trips. Third, I will talk about his sustained efforts to document police brutality and the killings of black men. Finally, we will revisit the symposium theme, It's Not Done Yet. In hindsight, it is easy to see how Emory Jackson became a journalist and civil rights activist. He was born on September 8, 1908, in the tiny Georgia town of Buena Vista, located about 120 miles south of Atlanta. His father was a carpenter and bricklayer by trade. His mother was a homemaker who cared for her own mother and five children. Beginning in 1916, the family moved in stages to Birmingham for better opportunities. They settled in the desirable Enon Ridge neighborhood where many black professionals lived. Emory Jackson was apparently the last to arrive in Birmingham. He joined his parents and siblings in August 1919 when he was almost 11. Later, his mother had two additional sons. I spent time with Jackson's youngest brother, Lavelle, in Detroit. He told me he remembered growing up in a household filled with books and newspapers. He listed the leading black papers of the day, including the Chicago Defender and Pittsburgh Courier, as well as local white papers like the Birmingham News. Mealtimes were lively with family discussions, Lavelle said, but everyone quieted down and listened when Emory talked about politics, education, and civil rights. Segregated schools in Birmingham absolutely bulged at the seams. The elementary school that Jackson attended was the most crowded of the 20 primary schools for Black youth. He and more than 1,800 other students jammed into Slater Elementary in July 1919, even though the Board of Education had just declared its buildings unfit and unsanitary for use. Jackson was among the pupils who attended ninth grade at a middle school that had just been created to help alleviate the overcrowding. But in September 1925, he started 10th grade at Industrial High School, which was similarly packed with students. He joined the debate club and learned skills that undoubtedly helped him later as a sought after public speaker. Jackson also was a fan of college football and the Birmingham Black Barons, one of the most successful Negro League baseball teams. Jackson began his journalism career as a sports reporter for the school newspaper, an endeavor he fondly recalled for the rest of his life. After graduating from industrial in 1928, Jackson left Birmingham to attend Morehouse College, the historically black all-male institution in Atlanta with a reputation for excellence in scholarship, leadership, and service. He studied ethics and their relation to everyday life and problems, public speaking, and writing and rhetoric, coursework that was sound preparation for an eventual career in journalism. Jackson wrote for the college paper and also served as associate editor. This 1932 editorial on the left hinted at his eventual career with the Birmingham world. He informed his peers that any group can better its condition when challenges are bravely met. Jackson was among the many Tiger staff staffers who later had illustrious careers in journalism at Ebony Magazine and other black periodicals. He also joined the college's political science club and served as the first president of the Morehouse student body the college's student government. That involvement almost certainly contributed to his lasting interest in civics and politics. Throughout his career, Jackson waged key short and long-term campaigns for the franchise. Among them were efforts to eliminate the poll tax, register people to vote, and defeat amendments that would have effectively disenfranchised black citizens in Alabama. Jackson, who was called E.O. and Jack by friends and family, graduated from Morehouse College in 1932 with a degree in English and minors in economics and education. 
Morehouse alumnus Cornelius Scott, who was known as C.A. Scott, founded the Atlanta World with his brother in 1928. The newspaper quickly caught on with readers and it became the nation's first daily publication for black readers. The Scots also established other papers, such as the Memphis World and a news syndicate to coordinate content and advertising for the newspaper chain. Jackson had a complicated relationship with his employers throughout his career. Cornelius Scott's managerial style alternated between hands-on and hands-off. Neither style suited Jackson. He complained about micromanagement, long periods of inattention to the Birmingham world, a persistent lack of resources to invest in skilled people and the product, and typesetting and printing errors at the Atlanta plant that Jackson argued affected his credibility as a newsman. Despite Jackson's apparent interest in reporting while in high school and college, he said he came to that career largely through accident. He returned to Birmingham after college and worked for a few years as a teacher at segregated schools. An early editor of the Birmingham World, himself a Morehouse alumnus who was familiar with Jackson's work on the campus paper, invited Jackson to join the Small World staff. Jackson accepted and did some feature and editorial writing while still teaching. Eventually, he decided that the classroom was just too confining for him. The newspaper offered a platform for documenting terrorism, such as bombings and police brutality, and opportunities to advocate civil rights and liberties. But while Jackson may have quit the classroom, he never stopped teaching. A man who knew the editor for 25 years said Jackson taught in his office, the Birmingham world, his home, your home, the street corners, bus stops, barber shops, neighborhood meetings, churches, schools, and every place he had the opportunity. Jackson, he said, dedicated his life to teaching all of us the serious business of being free. Whenever he traveled, Jackson had with him his fedora and a bundle of the Birmingham world to distribute but they also were props to help him hide his right hand. Summer jobs in foundries while he was in high school had left him with a disfigurement due to a bad burn, perhaps a result of scalding steam or a splash of molten metal. He was self-conscious about the injury and typically hit his right hand when he was photographed. The scarring may have affected his handwriting, which was nearly indecipherable, and prompted a unique style of typing that looked as if he was hitting the keys with his knuckles. Although this was not the portable typewriter that Jackson used, he toted a machine with him when he traveled so he could keep up with his columns and editorials, draft stories, and write letters. Unlike today's trim newspapers, the Birmingham World was a large format paper that measured 22 inches tall and 34 inches wide when fully opened. It featured eight dense columns across six or eight pages with local and national news, sports, some recipes and items for female readers and photos and advertisements. As a whole, newspapers by and for African-Americans advocated for civil rights and also reported news about blacks that was typically excluded from white owned newspapers. This story celebrates the large class of students who had just graduated from Miles College the historically black institution founded in Birmingham in 1898. Such news, along with births, weddings, deaths, and information about black owned businesses and church and club activities is critical to a group's identity and history. This story is particularly interesting because it mentions Polly Myers and Othrin Lucy. At the time, Myers was a columnist for the Birmingham World and thinking about a career in journalism or education, Lucy hoped to become a librarian, librarian or teacher. The women applied for admission to the University of Alabama in early September 1952 and were quickly welcomed to the school by the Dean of Admissions and other administrators. But when Myers and Lucy arrived on campus on September 20 to formalize plans for their first semester, the Dean reportedly informed them that an error had been made and tried to refund their deposits. Three days later, Emory Jackson wrote about UA and its decision to reject Myers and Lucy owing to their race. This photo shows, from left, Reverend James Ware, Myers, Attorney Arthur Shores, 
and Lucy discussing legal action in Shore's Law Library in Birmingham. Ware was an influential leader in Birmingham who had accompanied the women to campus. Shores was already one of the nation's top civil rights attorneys. Jackson covered the twists and turns of the four-year legal battle and also wrote editorials and columns. In some, he challenged the state of Alabama to join other enlightened Southern states that had already opened their colleges and universities to black students. In others, he commended Myers and Lucy for their fortitude, determination, and persistence. In addition, he assumed responsibility for raising funds for the women's legal battle. He spoke forcefully at rallies in Birmingham and around the state. In January 1953, he told a packed Montgomery church, the fight we are waging in this campaign for education defense funds is part of the struggle for academic freedom. It is part of the fight for vitalized freedom, freedom to be taught, to learn, to be understood and appreciated. What we do in this campaign will open doors which the hands of bigotry shall never close. We wage a battle for new opportunities in the American way. The Lucy Myers case dragged on during 1953. The lengthy administrative and legal process made coverage difficult but Jackson continued to include status updates in the Birmingham world and apprise readers of the legal strategy being directed by attorneys Arthur Shore and Thurgood Marshall. In July 1953, Jackson reported that Shore's blasted opposing counsel for stalling and deferring action on the case pending the outcome of the Brown case. So, when the Supreme Court issued its landmark decision in May 1954, Jackson expected that Myers and Lucy finally would be able to complete their enrollment and register for classes. But another year elapsed, during which time the Supreme Court hounded down its implementation decree in Brown, urging that the process of school integration be carried out with all deliberate speed. Finally, a federal court judge in Birmingham heard the case on June 29, 1955, Immediately after the closing arguments, he ruled that Myers and Lucy had been rejected solely on the basis of their skin color, and he declared that a group who has been discriminated against is entitled to the same protections under the 14th Amendment as an individual. Jackson published in the world what he called the judge's far-reaching decision, and in an editorial, he confidently declared that the decision had made it easier, easier for other jurists to follow the law as interpreted by the Supreme Court. Jackson praised Myers and Lucy for their priceless service to the race, but he also lamented that it required a court order for a public institution to do what it was morally, legally, and civically obligated to do as a facility of democracy. Nevertheless, the university appealed the decision Myers and Lucy remained in limbo until January 1956, when the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit up upheld the earlier ruling. Jackson bluntly observed, so that's it. The University of Alabama has a duty and responsibility to all of its citizens without regard to hostile factors. Jackson and the civil rights leader Fred Shuttlesworth accompanied the women to campus to help them complete enrollment. The group was photographed by a white cameraman for the Daily Birmingham News. Note the incomplete caption and the omission of Jackson, Myers, and Lucy. This underscores the historic erasure of women of color, and it reminds us that the Black press exists in part to counteract such erasures of the accomplishments of Black Americans. The group also was photographed leaving the administration building. In Jackson's hands, you can see a newspaper maybe a copy of the Birmingham World and his fedora. Lucy attended classes on Friday, February 3, thereby desegregating the University of Alabama almost three and a half years after she and Myers were initially accepted. The chanting mobs shouted epithets, attacked cars driven by blacks, and threw bricks, eggs, and gravel. The Board of Trustees suspended her and then expelled her from the university. Although Othrine Lucy declared that she planned to fight the expulsion, both she and Polly Myers moved on with their lives and careers, and Jackson grew busy with the two-month-old bus boycott in Montgomery 
and its charismatic young leader. One thing I find particularly interesting about Emory Jackson is the fact that he continued to advocate for people and issues long after stories stopped being newsworthy by journalistic standards. For example, the UA story essentially ended in 1956 when Lucy finally won the court case, but was subsequently expelled from the university. Yet Jackson continued to praise her and Myers at speaking engagements and in columns for years. For instance, in March 1971, Othrine Lucy Foster traveled from her home in Dallas to attend a program celebrating the founding of Miles College. Foster was presented a special citation, but Jackson wrote in his column that the commendation was an insufficient recognition of her efforts to integrate the University of Alabama. She was entitled to no less than an honorary degree, he wrote. Jackson also faulted Miles College for failing to invite Polly Myers Pinkins back to Birmingham for an award of her own. She had inspired her friend to try to enroll at Alabama. In fact, Jackson wrote, without Myers Pinkins, there most likely would not have been the Lucy case. I have no doubt that he would have celebrated both of the courageous and determined women this year on the 65th anniversary of the desegregation of the University of Alabama. The second topic I'd like to touch on today is Jackson's response to the attacks on the bus passengers and the newsmen who covered the interstate trips. For seven months in 1961, more than 400 black and white volunteers traveled through the South on regularly scheduled buses to test the 1960 Supreme Court decision in Boynton v. Virginia. John Lewis, pictured here, was among the civil rights activists who in 1961 joined an interracial campaign to test enforcement of the court decision banning, banning segregation on public transportation and in bus terminals and train stations. The Freedom Riders left Washington DC on two buses on May 1. Their plan was to travel through Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, ending in New Orleans. When the buses pulled into stations, the riders sought to eat at lunch counters, sit in waiting rooms, and use restrooms that had until recently been designated for white passengers. The dangers grew greater as the Freedom Riders traveled deeper into the South. Some of the bus passengers were attacked, some were arrested. The riders arrived in Atlanta on May 12 and met with Dr. King. They had hoped he would join them the following day for their trip through Alabama. Instead, he warned them about the Ku Klux Klan and urged them to reconsider their route. On Mother's Day, May 14, 1961, a Greyhound bus carrying some of the Freedom Riders arrived at the Anniston, Alabama bus station about an hour east of Birmingham. A mob led by a Klansman used pipes, chains, and bats to smash windows, slash tires, and dent the sides of the bus. Police made a show of escorting the crippled bus to safety, only to abandon it at the Anniston city limits. Another armed white mob surrounded the bus and began breaking windows. Then someone tossed a firebomb into the bus. Others barricaded the door and tried to trap the terrified passengers inside the burning vehicle. The crowd dispersed when the fuel tank exploded and the riders escaped through windows and the main door only to be set upon again by the mob. Freedom riders in the trailing second bus also were attacked in Anniston, and then they were viciously beaten when they arrived at the station in Birmingham. Stories by Jackson and wire service outlets appeared on the front page of the Birmingham World for several weeks. Jackson typically wrote one or two editorials for each issue of the Birmingham World, that amounted to hundreds of, of, of opinion columns during his long career. He stressed several themes in his editorials about the attacks on the Freedom Riders, including Birmingham's tarnished reputation and the important role of the white press in educating its readers about court decisions, such as the one in Boynton v. Virginia. Jackson also wrote a two-page letter to Birmingham Mayor Jimmy Green, which he subsequently published in the Birmingham World. Jackson again discussed the mob's actions, calling them shocking and poisonous to democracy. Then he pressed Green to exert moral leadership and uphold the law, 
and particularly the recent decisions of the Supreme Court. Lastly, Jackson emphasized the First Amendment and the media's right to observe, interpret, and report events. On that Mother's Day, Klansmen attacked WAPI radio reporter Clancy Lake and Birmingham Post-Herald photographer Tommy Langston. Jackson told Green that freedom of the press is critical to a democracy. And in fact, graphic images such as these were published in white newspapers across the country and in Europe. A subsequent CBS broadcast brought the violence into the homes of millions of Americans, white and black alike. Those who study the media say that coverage of the growing civil rights movement in the mainstream press and on TV helped galvanize public opinion and prod legislators to dismantle segregation and enact civil rights laws in their place. Meanwhile, Jackson and other editors of the black press continued to agitate for legislative reform. Presidents Kennedy and Johnson were among dozens of leaders that Jackson and the group met with over the years. In this photo, Jackson is next to the woman in the red dress. Birmingham is known as the magic city for the large welcoming sign that once greeted passengers arriving in the city by train. Jackson himself always thought of Birmingham as a magic city, even when atrocities such as bombings and police shootings broke his heart. He used the words police brutality to describe the killings of black men in Birmingham and other Alabama cities. In this final portion of my talk, I will discuss how Jackson documented the use of force and called for an end to the wanton violence. Please be aware that information in the following slides may be upsetting. Police brutality began not long after Eugene Bull Connor was elected Commissioner of Public Safety in 1937. Connor had worked as a telegraph operator, salesman, and sports radio announcer before running successfully for a seat in the Alabama House of Representatives in 1934. When he was elected commissioner three years later, he assumed administrative authority over services, including the police and fire departments and schools. Connor was known as a rigid enforcer of racial segregation and a white supremacist. And though he apparently was not a member of the Ku Klux Klan, he supported it by allowing Klansmen to attack the Freedom Riders in Birmingham before calling in the police. Jackson and Connor exchanged words on numerous occasions. According to one story, the commissioner warned Jackson to leave town, but the editor retorted, the state of Alabama is too small for two big men like me and you. I'm not going anywhere, so you'll have to go. The Thalheimer Award is the highest honor the NAACP bestows upon branches. The Birmingham branch received its first such prize in 1941, in part for its organized action in trying to reduce police brutality. Also that year, Connor was reelected to another four-year term as police commissioner. Jackson was the longtime secretary of the local branch and a strong advocate of the statewide and national organization. Jackson's use of the NAACP for advocacy along with the twice-weekly Birmingham World, earned him a reputation as a courageous man who was willing to take on Bull Connor and his police force. A longtime World employee recalled that Jackson was arrested several times by the commissioner on a ruse to try to shut the editor's mouth because he was waging such a vigorous fight against beatings and shootings. The brutality worsened after World War II. Returning veterans sought the franchise, housing, employment and educational opportunities, and civil rights. By 1948, Jackson was keeping and publishing detailed records of officer-involved violence. That April, he recounted three fatal shootings allegedly committed by police in Birmingham and surrounding communities during the previous three weeks alone. After the next shooting, Jackson wrote, Birmingham police notched on their bloody pistols, police victim four for 1948. Jackson pointed out patterns in the shootings. For example, victims were often shot multiple times in the back. He bluntly called the men target practice for police. 
The coroner typically ruled these incidents justifiable homicide. Jackson indicated his suspicion of official claims by intentionally using quotation marks around the verdicts. As he continued to tally the victims in 1948, he wrote, in the Birmingham area, police kill a Negro about every 15 days. After the 14th killing in 1948, he wondered how much longer the violence would proceed unchecked. He wrote, Negro citizens cannot feel safe in a city where law enforcement officers too often appear to be hostile to them. And indeed, the violence did continue year after year. This portion of the front page from April 5, 1949, reveals three incidents involving five individuals. By 1952, Jackson and the head of the NAACP's Washington, D.C. Bureau met with the Department of Justice. Jackson sought a federal investigation into the ongoing brutality that was occurring in Birmingham and other Alabama cities. He submitted information to the DOJ showing that police had killed 52 black men since 1948. Half of the slayings had occurred in Birmingham. Shootings continued unchecked until February 1972, when the killing of Willis Chambers finally led to some reform. He was arrested on a charge of public drunkenness just after midnight. Police said they were trying to place him in a patrol car when he broke away from officers, pulled a small knife, and lunged at them. Chambers was shot several times and later died. Jackson wrote in an editorial, it is the pattern, the number, the frequency, and the script of such killings that trouble the Birmingham world. He referred to the decades-old model he had observed of black men being shot in the back by one or more officers who were quickly exonerated by the coroner. The investigation confirmed Jackson's suspicions. Chambers had been shot in the back. The report rebuked the police department for its shoddy investigative procedures and recommended that police reopen the case. And though it stopped short of urging prosecution of the officer who killed Chambers, the report noted that four citizens had filed complaints against him in the months preceding the killing. In a front page editorial, Jackson wrote that the gravity of the situation warranted a grand jury investigation. He said the report revealed shocking and intolerable aspects of policing in Birmingham, and he suggested a broader investigation into the department and its policies. A grand jury did meet. It determined that officers who responded to the call exhibited poor judgment, and it called on the police department to do things such as improve arrest and search procedures, revise investigative methods used by the Homicide Bureau, and bring personnel files up to date and maintain them. But Jackson was disappointed with the findings. He said he thought the grand jury was going to dig into the pattern, frequency, and racial identity of the victims of justifiable police killing, again using quotations around the word justifiable. Nothing, however, puts his decades-long work into perspective more powerfully than a stack of three-by-five index cards, three inches high. These incident reports were among the civil rights records rediscovered in the City Hall basement in 2012 as Birmingham prepared to observe the 50th anniversary of its civil rights history. The cards include the names of the officers who were involved. Some mention the reason for the shooting, such as resisted arrest or tried to escape. Many include the words justifiable shooting, justifiable homicide, or murder. It wasn't until November 1979, four years after Jackson's death, that a policy was implemented to prevent, prohibit Birmingham police officers from using deadly force except when they believe their life or someone else's is in jeopardy. Jackson was a longtime member of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, the trade and advocacy group founded by Black publishers in 1940. He was scheduled to fly to New York City on September 11, 1975, for a meeting with the board of directors, but Jackson succumbed to prostate cancer the previous night. 
Emory Jackson interacted with Rosa Parks on numerous occasions for NAACP business, as well as during the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. In a sympathy note to Jackson's family, she wrote, I think of him as one of the great men of our time, as one dedicated to freedom and equality of all oppressed peoples. Much of my inspiration came from knowing and working with him before it was popular to speak out against injustice. On the same day that Parks wrote that note from her home in Detroit, hundreds of people from across the country gathered at a Birmingham church to pay their last respects to the vanishing editor of the Birmingham World. The Scott family continued to publish the world until 1989. Ownership then passed to a local man who had delivered the paper as a boy and participated in civil rights demonstrations as a young man. He led the weekly newspaper until 1998, when the last issue of the 67-year-old world came off the press. The UA College of Communication and Information Sciences established that same year, 1998, a Hall of Fame to honor, preserve, and perpetuate the names and accomplishments of individuals whose work exemplifies excellence and dedication. Other honorees that year included Martin Luther King Jr., Helen Keller, and Montgomery advertiser publisher Grover Hall Sr., who won a Pulitzer Prize for editorializing against the Ku Klux Klan. Jackson's image, etched in metal, is on a shelf in a glass case in the rotunda of the college's historic building. Jackson's brother Laval lobbied city leaders in Birmingham for more than a year in an effort to honor the journalist and his civil rights work. Finally, in 2012, this marker was placed at the site of the former Birmingham World Office near Kelly Ingram Park. The modest recognition came 37 years after Jackson's death. I know Jackson would have greatly appreciated the recognition, but perhaps the best tribute we can pay to him and to all civil rights activists, past and present, is to finish the fight for equality for everyone in this country. The May 2020 murder of George Floyd only highlighted what has been happening to Black Americans since slavery began in this country in 1619. Activists such as Jackson have sought to bear witness to the crimes and demand justice for the victims. He used the Birmingham world, the medium of his time, to track police shootings. Today, sites such as the Washington Post's Fatal Force, pictured in the lower right, monitor civilian deaths at the hands of police. In 2015, the database won the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting. Fatal Force continues to be updated using information submitted by individuals and verified by post staff to chronicle hundreds of police killings each year. Also important, of course, is the use of cell phones to document police brutality. These recent headlines echo the ones that appeared year after year in the Birmingham world, as Jackson and other civil rights workers pushed for the franchise, police accountability, equal educational opportunities, and an end to what we now call systemic racism. They contextualized the work that Emory Jackson did to secure a safe, an equal society for citizens. Jackson essentially said over and over, Black Lives Matter long before the present day social movement began in 2013. It has been an absolute honor to be a part of the 12th annual Discerning Diverse Voices Symposium on Diversity and to reflect on the legacy of Emory O. Jackson. Thank you so much and I look forward to your comments and questions.